Welcome to the Knowledge Graph seminar. We are at the seventh session today. Early on in the series, many people asked us about how should they go about implementing their knowledge graphs. And today that question is going to get answered. We have three very strong speakers with uh, industry products to build knowledge graphs and they are going to tell us all about their products. We will start with uh, Philip Ratley from Neo4j. Philip, over to you. All right, thank you, Vinay. Thanks all. Uh, great to be here. I'm gonna jump right in. I wanna start with a bit of context on how to use this talk, how to listen. Um, first of all, you've uh, heard about property graphs in some of the other talks, but not really delved uh, into many examples. And so this is gonna be a first opportunity to really hear about property graphs as distinct from RDF as a way to model uh, data and then when you bubble up the stack to query data. Secondly, I also don't think you've had a chance to look at graph algorithms. Um, this is a distinct kind of, uh, let's say, data processing activity from pattern matching queries, um, which, uh, uh, and I'd be surprised if Matei doesn't build on this and if uh, Yuri Leskovich doesn't build on it further uh, for you next week. So uh, maybe a first dip there at least in this uh, seminar. And then lastly, uh, my focus is gonna be very breadth first. Um, as you know, with graphs, you can write queries in a way where you're going very, very deep or you're going broad. Um, and uh, I, there's a lot to cover in this world um, in terms of what customers are doing, users are doing, what's happening in the community, what uh, products are out there. Um, my focus will of course be from my Neo4j experience, um, and you'll have opportunities to hear from Brad and others um, today and, uh, and going forward about other product approaches. But uh, I really wanna give you um, broad examples, but I've put in lots of citations um, and those are in the slides. So you can just follow links if you wanna hear any of the customer uh, customers speak from the customer examples or drill into documentation or downloads and so on. And then lastly, um, this I don't know the answer to. You may or may not have had many speakers uh, talk about software that's out there, free, open source that you can use and communities you can jump into. So I'll, I'll end with an invitation uh, and maybe some pointers on where you can go to just start uh, doing some work and, and learning. Let's jump in. A large number of industrial knowledge, knowledge graphs are powered by Neo4j. Um, one is NASA. There's a great talk here by David Meza, the chief knowledge architect for NASA that I've linked uh, with a, a pretty great story that uh, essentially they, th their initial, let's say, payback for the time and money invested in building out their knowledge graph was um, when building the Orion capsule, this capsule that's supposed to take, uh, take people to Mars, they um, ran into a problem where the, uh, I'll say, say I, I won't spoil the details, but they, they ran into a problem that uh, was a showstopper for the mission. And they ended up going back and interviewing astronauts and going through documents and just couldn't find the answer. And it's only when they were able to look at the system that happens to have been, happened to have been built by uh, David's team that they were able to go back and just ask some simple queries and within, uh, minutes of just asking the right questions against the right set of curated uh, information coming out of documents, they were able to come up with, with an answer. So this is a knowledge graph that is derived from documents. And you hear a lot of this, I know some of the earlier talks spoke about uh, knowledge graphs of documents. Uh, think of it though as documents are a source and inside that source, you can do NLP and uh, scan through text, come up um, and scan those documents for data. And that data is, uh, in this case, happens to be data about projects, about um, different objects, people, missions, and so on. Uh, another graph um, that uh, you have the opportunity to dive deeper into is the graph of meaning and concepts used to power eBay's converse, conversational commerce system. Um, so if you see the example here, can you show me a brown leather coach messenger bags under $100? You need to um, 
in order to be able to do the speech recognition and tie that back to concepts, you need to tie that back to um, a graph of meaning and how the concepts relate. And then that also happens to tie back to a graph of over a billion products that they have in their catalog. And the confluence of those two is a graph where um, the concepts relate to products. Another one um, is the German Center for Diabetes Research. Actually, recently they've reappropriated this system to um, help with COVID research. The um, uh, head of knowledge management and IT for the German Center for Diabetes Research has been uh, pursuing a pretty fascinating hypothesis that all the research necessary to make uh, significant advances in uh, curing diabetes has, have already been done, but that um, the results of that research just haven't been looked at in the right way, namely uh, this information from this paper here about mice connected to this paper here about something else connected to this paper here about humans. And um, last example, but not least, is uh, some really important um, investigative work that was done by journalists looking at um, a data leak that um, ultimately resulted in some uh, uh, pretty big re regulatory changes. And this, this was one of the big, biggest stories in the world a couple of years ago, if you kept track. In fact, it's the only knowledge graph that I'm aware of that has uh, resulted in the uh, in a Pulitzer Prize in 2017. And the way this went is something like this. There was a 2.6 terabyte hard drive of documents that was leaked to a German newspaper. And uh, they quickly turned the data over to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, um, since this was outside of the scope of what uh, the, the newspaper was able to do IT-wise. Um, what do you do with 11 and a half million documents? Well, it turns out that if you have some smart technologists and you apply lots of uh, open source software, you can uh, use open source ETL tools into uh, sc scanning NLP, um, ultimately curated into a graph. So what started as documents might end up with people, uh, people having bank accounts with a particular bank, but then that person can share an address with another person. And that's not very suspicious. Like probably a lot of you have people that uh, share a bank account um, and live at your address, uh, but they might be an officer of a company that has another bank account. And these are the kinds of patterns that people use to hide money. You can see how, if you look at this without a graph view, how um, this can be a really effective sort of obfuscation that um, most systems not designed to look at connections between data um, aren't going to notice these complex uh, connections. And this is actually a rather simplified one. And with graphs, something that's pretty unique, um, and particularly with property graphs, is that the uh, model that someone might whiteboard, here you just had like a conceptual uh, graphic, uh, graphic artist's rendering of the data, actually is, uh, can be overlaid with the uh, actual data in the database. This is a screenshot from our um, uh, from our development tool, uh, the Neo4j browser. And, uh, and that's one of the big uh, advantages that we've seen uh, with graphs and uh, specifically with property graphs is that the conceptual, logical, physical models are all maybe not 100% similar, but they're way more similar than different kinds of systems, including uh, relational, which uh, gets tabularized, normalized, and then denormalized, or with RDF, which is highly, highly normalized. I mentioned that the, um, the Center for German Diabetes Research is working on uh, finding a cure to COVID. Actually, they've paired together with a, a large number of companies on uh, uh, what's now covidgraph.org. And if you have any inclination to spend any cycles doing good with your data science uh, skills, um, this is a good place to do it. And I'll point to a number of other links. Again, uh, you follow this link and you'll see, a, um, you'll, you'll be able to watch some of these recorded talks. But my point in doing this is in showing that, uh, I, I actually believe that the term knowledge graph hasn't really been fully shaken out and understood. It can mean any number of things. Some people mean it to mean graphs of meaning some and concepts. Uh, other people use it to mean graphs of how data moves between systems. So like metadata, data lineage. Other people use it to describe um, the 
connected data set that's used as input into a machine learning process. Uh, so here you can see a variety of different kinds of graphs, all of which people consider to be knowledge graphs. Um, and let's see how, how things evolve. It may be in a few years that word takes on very specialized meaning or meanings. It may be that just knowledge graph just uh, becomes synonymous with any uh, data set that has some sort of value that's uh, stored as a graph. I want to talk a bit about the popularity of graphs and specifically this uh, points at property graphs. There is a site, dbengines.com, that uh, does all kinds of number crunching and looks at uh, uh, various measures of uh, a uh, database's uh, popularity. Um, and if you go to the site, they talk about how that score is calculated, but effectively it's something they refresh every month and that you can plot. And if you exclude property graphs, this is how since 2013, when they started tracking things, how uh, the relative growth in different areas has been. Um, and property graphs has just been a, a, a strong outlier. They've been uh, growing significantly, granted from a very small base, uh, but uh, this, this is a technology that's really continued to take off and not slow down. Um, you can drill in and get information about what particular databases are more popular. You'll see Neo, Neo4j up there and, and others. Um, let's talk more about property graphs. Uh, the property graph model was motivated by storage and management of data, uh, particularly data that's valuable to a business, um, as well as querying, being able to query that data, particularly through patterns. Um, and with uh, end users who are developers, but also applications. Um, that's different from the heritage of RDF. The heritage of RDF, it's a um, W3C standard. So it's a World Wide Web Consortium standard, originally built, built for tagging data on the World Wide Web. And this is the fact you heard in one of the earlier presentations that 30% of the World Wide Web uses RDF in some way to tag the meeting uh, tied back through schema.org. It's really motivated by that and then by being able to exchange data and have machines consume and understand that uh, this particular art, uh, thing is an article, it has an author, this is the author, this is the subject and so on. Um, and so these two have maybe converged a bit um, on, on the API side, but they're fundamentally um, born of different uh, visions and uses. One important difference, there are a few, I'll just uh, point out one, is that nodes and relationships inside of a property graph have internal structure, meaning a relationship not only has a type and a direction, but it can have one or more properties that are effectively, effectively named values or named value pairs where a value can potentially be a, um, a map or an array. And uh, same with nodes. Nodes can also have um, properties and uh, um, properties as well as labels. And inside of RDF, there's no internal structure. So effectively, uh, everything gets blown out um, into uh, interrelationships. So Philip is connected to his hair color, his eye color, his date of birth. Um, there, there are contexts where that can be useful. There are contexts where it can be uh, a little, um, uh, in terms of developing an application where uh, ease of use, perhaps uh, some, some might say uh, favors the property graph. And you hear me use the term node and relationship. That's colloquial, that's a collo colloquialization of vertex and edge. Um, in the Neo4j world, we, uh, because we're focused on building tools that are consumed by developers who uh, may know about programming, but may not have a very uh, a super deep graph or computer science or data science background, it's, uh, and, and then communicate with business users. Uh, those terms are just a little bit human friendly. I also feel like relationship um, speaks to the nature of two things are really bound together, tied together, they're related, whereas edge is almost like uh, uh, in English language speaks to a division between things. So uh, it's just a preference. Um, we, we use both, we tend, tend to use relationship and node more often. I talked about these components, I won't dwell on them uh, too much. Uh, here you have two nodes, each with a label of person. Label is uh, something in the property graph you can use to denote um, a, a kind of thing, a um, uh, 
relationships tend to be verbs. So I have drives, owns, uh, and probably also has a drives. And uh, because Dan and Anne are uh, Stanford grads uh, working in AI, they of course own and drive a Tesla. And if you look at the relational model, the way I would uh, model something like a, okay, this is a terrible example because uh, you wouldn't have a friend table on the right side, you'd have a person. Pretend this is like person, person skill, and skill. And uh, you've all seen these tables in the middle, which are join tables, which are used to relate things. Basically the join table in a property graph just becomes a relationship. And also um, each row in the database becomes a node. So you can see these, the one node, the three relationships and the three, uh, the three rows. And property graphs, there's nothing that can be represented in a relational model that can't be represented in a property graph. In fact, we've been doing a lot of standards work inside of uh, ISO and various other places. Uh, we also built some, some tech for, and, uh, for doing this inside of Spark to, to basically map tables into graphs. Um, there are some, some things that effectively probably don't matter much in the real world uh, that can't be modeled in relation, relational, that can be modeled in property graphs having to do with like valueless properties, uh, valueless nodes, uh, not really important for all intents and purposes, they're isomorphic. And uh, there's a language, there are a number of languages around this. I'm gonna talk one that we invented and that we opened up in 2000. 15 um, in keeping with our open source roots and really the feeling that for this to be a very large space, uh, which uh, we I, I very much believe uh, it, there needs to be a single open language. Um, and this, uh, this language, which also served as the derivative for some other languages uh, and is used by not just Neo4j, but a number of other technologies is, um, is really based in patterns and ASCII art. So you can see how uh, these are, uh, you have some ASCII art derivatives here that uh, really make it easy to read and understand. This isn't a query, really. Um, a query looks kind of like this. So if I want to say, who loves this person named Anne? The left, you can see how to do it in Sparkle if you're in the RDF world. And in Cypher, it's match who loves a uh, person. And then you have uh, Anne in the where clause. I can also anchor Anne up in the up in the match and return who as a variable. And then if you wanna do things in SQL, uh, quite the more graphy something is, meaning the more, uh, the more hops and the, the more the number of hops is unknown, the more uh, queries get uh, very long on the SQL side uh, and still pretty terse uh, and concise on the Cypher side. On the, I'll close the property graph section by saying that uh, on the language front, there's been a lot of activity happening inside of ISO. Um, the, there, there was a vote last year, uh, last September, where the majority of representative uh, countries voting, and ultimately this represents over 100 countries that use ISO standards, uh, voted for the first time in 30, 40 years that um, graphs merit a new language as opposed to SQL usually is like the, the Borg uh, in Star Trek and just absorbs all new languages and models. Um, so we think this is pretty cool. Uh, we're big uh, participants and it's, it's a fun opportunity for us to sit at the table with um, a lot of uh, vendors, academics, companies that maybe in some ways uh, might, be, might have competing products. But at the end of the day, as Brad and I were talking about before we started, uh, we both agree that it's, uh, there's, there's, this is a big space, um, there's a long way to go, and um, it takes a lot of people working together to, to float this boat. I'm going to jump into knowledge graphs. Increasingly, if you look at the number of uh, academic research papers and AI focused on graphs, it's skyrocketed. Um, there's a lot of uh, increased uh, interest in uh, understanding connections and feeding that into your quote AI, which really means machine learning for the most part and, uh, and your knowledge graphs. And um, we uh, co-authored a book uh, filled with examples for both Neo4j and, um, and Spark, um, an O'Reilly book, and that's had uh, 
over 50,000 downloads. It's a, this is a pretty popular topic. And really this is predicated on the notion that, and I, I'm gonna quote James Fowler here from this book, Connected, he's a sociologist, that increasingly we're learning that you can make better predictions about people by getting all the information from their friends and friends' friends than you can from the information you have about the people themselves. So I can learn more about a node in a network by understanding the network around them than uh, by looking at all the facts in the world about that particular person. So how do you do that? Well, the problem with machine learning today is the data that gets fed in gets fed in as a table and you're used to feeding in individual facts. And what you really wanna do is this. So how do you do that? There, there are a couple ways to do that. I'll talk about it in a bit. Um, graph data science is, is our term, but I think it adequately describes um, the confluence of what do you get, um, what does a data science uh, need when uh, trying to do what I just described? Um, you need to be able to query graphs, you need to be able to persist them to and assemble them. Um, so there's a graph database underneath, usually, um, unless you're doing a one-off. Uh, and then you wanna be able to run graph algorithms. This is distinct from the querying that I showed is your um, imperative converging uh, heavy duty queries. Um, and then uh, graph visualization also plays a role here. And the confluence of those three things is, uh, is what we're calling graph data science. We see graph data science evolving in a few steps. I think most of the world is still very much at the far left with knowledge graphs, but then as uh, we're starting to see more and more interest and in use of graph analytics, um, graph feature engineering is a way to marshal up information that either comes from a declarative query in your knowledge graph or is the result of a graph algorithm um, and just uh, taking that as a scalar and shooting it into your machine learning. Um, and then, uh, and then you've got more complex stuff that is uh, probably a few years out in terms of more general use um, outside of the Googles and Facebooks of the world. We have a graph data science library. Actually, it's, um, I should mention that it's uh, a different API than the examples in the book. So make sure you look at the documentation for, for this so that you don't get frustrated trying to uh, use one versus the other. That happened because this is a super fast moving space and there's a lot of innovation happening here. Um, and uh, at, it, at its core, it's about just having lots of different kinds of algorithms and functions. These group into pathfinding and search, centrality, so how important is a thing um, based on the shape of the graph, community detection, link prediction and similarity. Uh, and then uh, each of these has its own whole, you know, sets of math and optimizations underneath it. Um, I'm gonna walk you through one example is a tip of the hat to Stanford and Google um, with uh, PageRank being uh, really what differentiated Google from the initial world where you had uh, 30 plus uh, startups all trying to index and search the World Wide Web. Um, PageRank was uh, uh, an innovation that uh, catapulted them above the rest. So really, uh, Google was born out of graphs. And what this does is it uh, weights each node according to the number of inbound relationships, but then that's gameable. Um, and so in order to ungame the system, you then redo it with a weighting uh, where each inbound relationship is weighted based on the score that th the node at the opposite end got. Well, then that's not precise enough. So then you can just keep iterating. Um, so this is how you call it. And, um, and here's a more generalized example of how you call the graph algorithms in Neo4j. They're all now callable through the same API. So this is the part that's different from the book. And you've got these various um, uh, parameters. For example, here, execution mode gives you an, an option to stream your results back or to write them back to the graph or to um, return, uh, just return the data st statistics back. 
Uh, we've run this uh, in a number of real world scenarios. Um, one example from an actual customer who has 436 million households across over a billion um, transactions with uh, nearly a million items in their catalog and uh, about 14 billion relationships. So this is uh, not the largest of graphs, but it's a pretty hefty um, retail graph. And uh, what uh, here, you can see some run times here. Some of these are sub minute. Um, page rank takes just over two minutes. This is on, um, let's say, not super exotic hardware, but not not the smallest of hardware either. Um, so pretty pretty good performance and scalability. A couple of customer examples. Um, I won't speak through these. You can uh, follow the links and hear the talks if you're interested. Uh, here you've got um, examples from uh, Meredith, which owns a bunch of media properties, including Tem Time Magazine and a bunch of others, and uh, AstraZeneca, who's a drug research company. I will close by saying, well, how do you get involved? The good news is um, I'm not just showing you technology that you need to be a big company or have a lot of big, a lot of money to use. Um, there's a big open source community that I uh, welcome you to you know, take part in. You can spend as much or as little time or be as much read only or you know, answering all the questions as you want. Um, you're, you won't be wasting your time uh, you know, learning graphs in general, even if you end up using something other than Neo4j. If you do end up using Neo4j, it turns out um, according to Upwork for the last two quarters they've been doing their ranking, Neo4j has uh, popped into the top 20 fastest growing skills for independent professionals. This is, this is mostly tech skills just as a function of tech, tech skills being fastly growing, but it's actually just general job skills. Um, and uh, there's a Neo4j ecosystem with lots of free uh, and open source tools. A good place to get started is uh, if you just go to neo4j.com slash download, you'll uh, get this thing called Neo4j Desktop, which is free. It runs at Neo4j Enterprise Edition on your desktop. Uh, there's a nice install that includes all the dependencies, can get the latest version of the Graph Data Science Library, and lots of other stuff. It also includes um, some nice uh, user interfaces for writing queries, visualizing your results. We just made our uh, graph visualiza uh, visualization tool Bloom available for free as part of this for, for desktop, for uh, for personal and, and learning and non-production use. And then there are some stacks around this grand stack if you're building an application uses GraphQL with Neo4j. Neo Semantics has an RDF to Neo4j mapper. If you need to communicate with RDF applications, you can still store the data in the graph. Um, the graph data science uh, library, the Neo4j database, grand stack, um, a lot of this stuff is open source. So um, knock yourself out. Um, and just to zoom out a little bit more, our partners GraphAware have done this amazing um, landscape map of the graph space. Um, you can see a link to their blog, blog post here, but uh, you just look at the number of different uh, graph databases, visualization tools, conferences, books, um, BI tools, you name it. It's, uh, it's just been amazing seeing the growth in this area and how much is out there. So you can, uh, we're, we're now at the point where you could spend probably an entire career and just, uh, and, and never really master even what's out there today, which, um, which I think is exciting. Um, so that is all I've got uh, for now. We'll, I'll, I'll start answering questions in the background and uh, I believe, um, Vinay, correct me if I'm wrong, we've got some Q&A uh, at the end. So stay yes, tuned for that. Yeah, thank you, Philip. We'll uh, move right along. Uh, Brad, it's over to you. All right, let me uh, go ahead and share my screen here. All right, can everybody uh, see the slides okay? All right. So uh, I'm Brad Beebe. I run Amazon Neptune. Neptune, of course, is AWS's fully managed graph database service. And I wanna thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk today and thank everybody for your time 
uh, sort of been listening. My first experiences with GRAPH were in the late 90s. I was working uh, with the Defense Advanced Research and Planning Agency, or DARPA. And we were largely doing different kinds of knowledge representation, situational awareness model, trying to build information systems that help people to understand uncertainty, understand what was going on with different courses of action and make these kinds of decision-making trade-offs. It was, of course, around that time that the very early foundations of what we now call the semantic web were getting started. So, of course, we had the RDF or the resource description framework. We had the DARPA's DAML program or the defense, uh, the DARPA agent markup language the semantic, uh, Scientific American article on the semantic web. And then in 2004, the first version of the OWL language. For me, at that time, I really got working on what we called then sort of semantic web applications. Um, while we today would probably call them graph applications, at the time we talked a lot about a metadata management, taxonomies, uh, machine understandable representations. And there were a number of different uh, RDF triple stores and graph databases that both emerged from sort of the DAML program and some of the oil efforts. And then in 2005, I believe, Oracle released uh, Oracle 10G R2, which also had support for RDF. And we started to see different database options there. And the kinds of applications that we're building, you know, we're very much still along these themes of information retrieval, lots of entity extraction pieces. Often the technology, in my experience, didn't really scale to the vision of the application. So in many cases, we ran into data scale challenges, uh, maintaining query performance as, as applications got larger. In the little black hole here, I spent a few years kind of off doing large scale data analytics, uh, Hadoop Spark ecosystems, identity resolution things. And then in 2014, I came back to Graph and became the CEO for what's now called Blaze Graph. Blaze Graph, of course, is an open source uh, graph database project. It was originally started in 2006 as the big data store for RDF. And one of the things that I noticed was that there was a really a marked change in how people thought about the space. I mean, people were really talking about graph applications more so than just RDF and Sparkle applications uh, or even property graph sides. And then in our side, in 2015, the Wikimedia Foundation was looking to start a service that allowed them to expose the structured data that the Wikimedia Foundation maintained. And they called this the Wikidata Query Service. And in doing that, they looked around at a set of different technologies to manage this data. And they ended up choosing BlazeGraph. And it's a sort of an interesting dialogue if you go back and read uh, their selection piece, but they looked across both the property graph and the RDF space. And in their case, they found that the sort of a Sparkle set solution made sense for them. In 2016, I joined AWS. In 2017, we announced the preview of Amazon Neptune. 2018, we announced the general availability. And here in May 2020, Neptune's turning two. And I would say in the sort of Amazon spirit, it's still day one for graph. Customers really are excited about graphs. They're excited about linking things together. They're excited about the kinds of applications that they can build. One of the reasons is of course that graphs are everywhere. Graphs as a data structure turn out to show up in everything as broad as knowledge graphs and social networkings to different kinds of biological processes. This particular graph we're gonna revisit later, 
but it is a graph of airports and air routes that was put together by Calvin Lawrence as part of his book, which is called A Practical Guide to Gremlin, to teach people how to use Apache Tinkerpop and Gremlin uh, for property graphs. A question that we often get from customers is, when should I use a graph? And the answer is when your application is about relationships. If you need to relate different pieces of information and then ask questions over them, be it traversals or graph patterns, these are the kinds of spaces where graphs make sense. Here we have sort of six different use cases that we look at from the Neptune perspective, but it's overall, it's a very broad space, but it's really about relationships and when you need to manage them as part of your application. A natural follow-up is, you know, what kind of database should I use to manage these kinds of relationships? And in particular, can I use a relational database or a key value store for this? And the answer is, you know, absolutely that you can. Um, Philip had a great slide about the challenges of using SQL for graph. I think if you recall, extremely long SQL statement and a very short cipher statement. And so one reason is SQL is very difficult to express graph patterns in using joins. But also the kinds of access patterns for your data that you tend to see in graphs, graphs have a high degree of self joins, are very different than what you see in relational databases. And so relational databases often aren't optimized for graph access patterns. And finally, what I see as potentially the biggest drawback of using a non-purpose built solution is that one of the real benefits that people get from using a graph is that you could quickly and easily make relationships between data sets that weren't intended to be together to do new things and create new capabilities. And because of the performance limitations, people often end up having to denormalize their data to be able to get good traversal performance for a given application. And that means that every time you want to add a new relationship or change your graph, you've given up that flexibility. And so by using a non-purpose built solution, you lose the ability to be very agile and innovate quickly within your graph. Since we've launched, Thousands of Neptune customers have created thousands of Neptune instances with really diverse use cases from knowledge graphs to fraud to catalog management. And I'll also comment that we see more than two thirds of our usages from different kinds of internal AWS and Amazon usage. So there's lots and lots of different demand out there. But when I talk to customers about graphs, and I've talked to thousands of customers about their graph applications, when they think of a graph, they think of something like this. They think of associating people and product purchases, or maybe social networks and, and people and their relationships. And maybe they wanna make recommendations about what products someone should purchase, or maybe they wanna make a recommendation for friends. Or sometimes their graphs look like this, in which case they're looking at representing different pieces of where are different pieces of art located? What about geographical facts about cities and places and travel and answering questions like what museums should Alice visit while she's in Paris? But one thing that they're typically not really thinking about is graph models and frameworks. They're not necessarily thinking about, do I want to use a property graph or RDF? And so, you know, today, you know, there's really two major graph models. There's of course property graph. Property graphs consist of nodes and links. There's lots of different property graph implementations. As of today, there's no specific standards, although there certainly are activities along the way. Apache Tinkerpop Gremlin is one of the major open source ones. Of course, we talked about OpenCypher. Uh, other vendors have different uh, property graph query languages as well. On the RDF side, 
RDF, of course, was originally built to describe resources on the web. It represents graphs in terms of triples. There's a declarative graph query language associated with RDF that's called Sparkle. And it also has different standards and things for doing different data interchange pieces. And what we see within our customers is that really customers want both. I've had a number of different conversations where customers come in and they're really, really excited about building a graph. You know, they, they've taken a particular business problem and you know, they decided, you know, we want to build a knowledge graph or we want to build a graph-based recommendation service. And they're really excited about it. And then all that excitement dies and there's sort of palpable anxiety as they, they look at you and they say, should we use a property graph or an RDF graph? And, and for me as a vendor, so that's kind of the wrong thing for customers is they, we should take that excitement about graph and really figure out how to take it and make them successful. So for Neptune, really supporting both graph models is in our DNA. It's a core aspect of the product hypothesis for Neptune. And so the core of Neptune itself is this blue rectangle, which is a purpose-built storage engine that's optimized for graph traversals. It's durable with an acid with immediate consistency. And we support both a property graph interface with support for Apache Tinkerpop and Gremlin. And then we also provide a Sparkle endpoint with support for Sparkle 1.1 and RDF 1.1. In addition, we provide different interfaces and APIs to let you build graph applications. So loading data, managing your database, uh, integrating with text indices and these kinds of things. Neptune is delivered as a fully managed cloud-based service. And that means that we're built on a cloud native storage service, which was originally developed for other instance-based databases at AWS, but is what we're using as well to provide high availability, read replication, and encryption at rest. The storage architecture itself uses a scale out model. Each Neptune cluster has a single shared view of the storage layer. That storage layer grows in 10 gigabyte segments, which are automatically replicated six times across three different AWS availability zones. And the service itself manages the replacement of storage nodes, the optimization of the storage layouts on disk, and then up to 16 different read replicas can read independently off of the shared view of that storage layer. It's also the same mechanism that we use to provide read replication and high availability. One of the things about Neptune is it's very easy to create highly available graph database clusters. As you provision it, you simply check create a read replica and you have a highly available cluster. The way that that works is that each cluster has one node that's in the role of a write master, up to 15 different nodes that are in the role of read replicas. And as you make writes to the write master, once the commit point is confirmed by the storage layer, it rolls forward and all of the read replicas will read off of that same commit point. The write master has strong immediate consistency. The read replicas have a repeatable read consistency. And we publish out a metric with the replication lag, which is typically less than 10 milliseconds between the write master and the read replicas. In the case where you have a node that fails, that node is automatically replaced by the service. So how does Neptune represent its data underneath? So let's go back to the air routes data set. And here I've picked a very small example um, from the air routes. And in this case, we're really looking at a couple of examples of routes between Seattle and Frankfurt. And there's three here. I can go through Tokyo, I can go through Las Vegas, or I can go through Seoul. And you can see that in this basic model, each of the circles represents a node, each of the arrows represents a directed edge, and then there's properties on the graph, the numbers within the circles represent the IDs. And this is a basic graph 
that will take you through both a property graph and an RDF example from a Neptune. So within Neptune, all of the graph data is stored in what we call a quads layout. So each piece of graph information is stored as a, as a subject predicate or object of a graph. And so on your left hand side, you'll see a pictographic form. And on the right hand side, you'll see an SPOG form of the same data. So if you look across the first row, you can see that we're describing this node 22, which actually represents the airport code for Seattle. Uh, there's an ID in the subject position. We have a predicate, which we're calling code here, and then an object, which is the value. In this case, in the graph position, we're leaving it as default graph. If we go down to the next row, you'll see that we're actually describing an edge here. And we have the from is the node with the ID 22. The predicate here is route, which would correspond to a label and other models. And the object itself, which is the two, is the Tokyo Haneda Airport with code 105. And you can see that in the case of a property graph, we're also giving this edge, an edge ID, E1 in this case, which we're storing in the graph position. And, and that's how, for the case of a property graph, you'll end up associating properties with the edges. Now, we can represent the same information within an RDF graph. Same graph on the left-hand side. Here is the SPOG layout of that data within Neptune. Now, a couple of things to note. Because RDF uses URIs or IRIs, internationalized resource identifiers, uh, you can see we're using the prefixes there. Um, so instead of just node IDs, you're seeing IRIs in these positions. But fundamentally, the layout is the same. And then you'll also note the first line looks very similar. So you have the airport code SEA with the object value, the literal value SEA in the default graph. But if you look down the second line, you'll see in this particular model, we're using name graphs to allow us to effectively make property values on the edges. And so the graph resource colon one, which you'll see in this, in this sort of second line there, uh, is a named graph and we'll use that in other parts. And we're not gonna go through it in this presentation, but you can use that in other parts of the model to then effectively refer to sort of properties of edges. And there's other techniques to do this as well. Reification done by RDF star, and a few other pieces. So within Neptune, we create three different indices that we use to manage and evaluate queries over this SPOG layout. So the first index that we create is the SPOG index. This allows you for very fast, efficient lookups when you have a subject and a predicate bound effectively. So if you wanna look up an airport or node and node ID, that's effectively an index lookup in Neptune. The second index that we carry is the POGS, predicate object graph subject. Um, this allows you very fast lookup if you have a predicate and an object bound. And the last index that we carry is the GYPSO index, the graph predicate subject object index, which allows you to have very fast lookup with a graph and a predicate bound. We have all of these documented within the link that I created here on sort of our data model for the piece for the, for the overall service. Now, one of the things that I think every vendor wants to know or is interested in or has done some discussion about is how big is the graph market segment um, and, and what does it consist of? And I think if we look at it from one perspective as the set of customers who know they want a graph database or sort of self-identify as a property graph database or as an RDF database, then you know, we might represent it as a circle with a diameter like this. And if we look at it as the set of customers who can benefit from a graph database or benefit from processing information 
as a graph, then it looks like a much larger set. And so, you know, when we think about the graph segment, we really think about how do we enable graph and enable customers to build different graph applications. And what, what we see from customers is that they have use cases across different data models. Often they want to use both property graph and RDF. Sometimes this is driven by developer team preferences. Sometimes this is driven by existing applications. Often it's driven by initiatives where you want to bring different parts of the organization together. So maybe you bring people who are thinking about information architecture and want to do semantic alignment and data canonicalization with people who want to build business applications. And so here you have a natural use case for kind of RDF and property graph transitions. Customers also really want to understand how do I model data in a graph? It's not always clear how you should represent things. It's not always clear, should I make, model something as a node or a vertex and what are the trade-offs? Um, people want to query their graph data. They want to query property graph data with Sparkle. They want, to, they want to run Sparkle queries over their property graph data for different cases. And customers want to exchange data. They want to move between different property graph implementations. They want to move between RDF and property graph implementations. And there's some tools like RDF Star and Sparkle Star that can help do that. And so from my perspective, enabling graph really means we need to think about the larger set of graph users and graph applications. And I often say, you know, tongue in cheek that a rising graph floats all nodes, edges, and properties. But it really, we want to make it easier for customers to model their data as a graph, easy for them to query their data as a graph, and allow people to interchange data between different graph models to enable these different kinds of applications. So it's just graph. Let's really make it that way for everybody. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. We've also included some resources uh, in the slides if you want to take a look at them for learning about different kinds of graph models or other pieces. But thank you very much for your time. So our next speaker, Mateer, he has not arrived. He had promised he'll be here by 520. So I expect him here any minute. But while we are waiting, maybe we can take some uh, questions. Uh, I think the question that has been on my mind is this interesting diatomy between property graphs and RDF. And, and Brad, from your presentation, the impression that I got was that with the same storage format, you can either store property graph or you can store RDF. It, it, doesn't really make a difference. And I'm still sort of confused because I mean, I've observed some graph projects from a distance and there is this question of how do you, what, what's the right graph? You know, what should you put within a property node versus whether it should be a relation between two property nodes. It, it just seems pretty arbitrary to me. And it's still like, it's still not crystallized in my mind, you know, what, what's really the trade-off I mean, or is there a trade-off or it's just a superficial thing because ultimately the customers neither want RDF nor property graph. They want something high level. So right. are we trying to solve the wrong problem or what's the right way to think about it? Well, from my perspective, I think that, you know, there's graph modeling questions, which I, I view as, a little bit above the property graph and RDF questions. And then there's kind of RDF and property graph specifics. And, and I really think we need to be focusing on the graph modeling questions and, and how to make those easy for customers and easy to, to take these different ideas that people have to build knowledge graphs or to populate machine learning models or uh, do deep learning over their graph and figure out how to get that data there. And the, the, I think that the in my view, as vendors, we make too much of the distinction between property graph and RDF. Yeah, adding, adding to that, I, I was gonna make the same observation that uh, you did, Brad, that uh, how to, whether you're using property graphs or RDF as the basis 
technological basis for your for your knowledge graph, you still have to answer the tough questions around how do I want to model this? Should I, uh, you know, in RDF it shows up as should I reify properties and you know how how uh, in in the property graph world it shows up as should this particular thing be a property on a node or should it be a label or should it be a node in itself? Um, so and those kinds of questions get more and more important at scale. Arguably, it doesn't make a difference if you're dealing with 10,000, 100,000, a million uh, nodes and relationships. Um, if you're into the billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions and beyond, then um, it, it can make a very big difference. Um, so there are performance as well as logical considerations. Um, I, 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 in terms of what, how much a developer should worry about what model to use, I think that partly depends that answer probably depends on on we vendors and partly on whether you're responsible for building the graph or consuming the graph. I think if you're building the graph, there's no way around having to, from a right perspective uh, and a tuning perspective and so on, need to, under, need to understand the difference between the two physical models. But on the read side, to the degree that it's possible to write um, language APIs that map to any backend, um, for, for example, uh, Neptune supports Gremlin and Tinkerpop. Neo4j happens to as well. Um, most users prefer to use Cypher. Um, uh, Enzograph is an example of a uh, of an RDF store that recently added access for Cypher. So I, I think as time goes on, as as the standardization work moves on, and uh, you know, as customers vote for language that they they like. At the end of the day, the vendors are going to respond and build support for the languages um, and uh, and and make the the build a bit less of a concern. So I I, I think I partly agree, Brad, with your assessment that uh, certainly on the read side and you know and then over time uh, maybe it becomes if if I'm consuming the graph as opposed to building it, um, it, it makes less of a difference. Okay. Well, our third speaker just arrived. Uh, so, Mate, you want to go? You are up next. Uh, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Let me just turn on your uh, video also. Okay. Okay. Perfect. We okay, can see great. you. Um, okay. Hi. So, should I just share my screen and start? Yes. Yes, please. All right, let's see if I can share just this PowerPoint thing. Um, okay, do you see it? Yes, we see it. Okay, great. And, and just to check again, like how much time do you want me to speak for? None, you have 30 minutes. Okay, uh, including questions or? Well, we, after you're done, we have another 20 minutes for- Oh, I see, okay. Okay, so I got a bunch of time. Yeah, I just wanted to check how we're doing on time. Um, okay, great. So yeah, so I'm, I'm um, excited to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about large scale graph processing um, with Apache Spark, which is an open source, uh, you know, parallel computing engine that, um, that uh, I've uh, been involved with. Um, and I should say, so, you know, I'm, I am an assistant professor at Stanford, but most of this work um, is done at a startup company, Databricks, that I'm also part of. So I'll be speaking mostly with my Databricks hat on here about what we've seen there with, um, uh, you know, with large scale graph analytics. Um, um, and a lot of the stuff shown here is also open source. So you can actually try it out and uh, play with it if you want. Okay, let's see. So yeah, so just to motivate, so I'm, I'm gonna focus specifically on working with really large graphs uh, for both knowledge graph use cases and also other maybe more basic types of processing that you would use maybe to construct a knowledge graph uh, or just to construct data that you wanna uh, use for machine learning in general. And uh, the, the interesting thing here is there are a lot of domains that do uh, produce very large graphs just naturally, especially anything with automatically generated like machine generated or machine collected data. And there are actually some really cool applications um, in these domains and you know, people are still figuring out exactly what's possible, but I want to show you some of them. Um, 
So I'll show you a few example use cases at the like many terabytes or even into the petabytes uh, scale of data. Uh, and then I'll talk about some tools that, um, you know, we've worked on at Databricks um, uh, to tackle them and also some things I worked on as um, research projects. Um, and then, yeah, I want to leave a, a bunch of time for questions. Uh, so just for some background on me, so I'm an assistant professor in CS here. I work mostly in computer systems and uh, systems for machine learning as well. Um, and um, I did my PhD at Berkeley, uh, where the main uh, topic of it was uh, like designing the, the Apache Spark engine. So basically I started the project and designed a lot of the, the APIs and so on, um, and then helped design a lot of libraries on top. So, so that's kind of my background. Um, and uh, also in, in 2013, um, I also co-founded uh, Databricks. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's a startup that provides uh, data and machine learning platform on top of public clouds, on top of Amazon and Azure. And um, it's grown a bunch since then. So it has around, it has thousands of uh, enterprise customers. That's what it's focusing on. And together, it, it also operates at a pretty large scale. So all of the machines running on Databricks are processing, uh, you know, exabytes of data uh, per day. Um, and there are also like millions of VMs launched per day uh, in all, all of the public clouds that we run on. So uh, it's mostly targeting large scale use cases. And the platform is uh, is based on open source. Um, it's obviously based on Spark, but we also um, kind of started new open source projects, Delta Lake uh, for data management and uh, MLflow for machine learning. So overall, the scale of the service is actually pretty large, even compared to the cloud provider's own services. We actually operate at larger scale than some of the ones that Amazon uh, and uh, Microsoft and Google and so on built. So because we focus only on the large scale use cases, really. Um, so let me start by talking about some use cases for large graphs, and then I'll talk about a little bit about how uh, we implement some of this. Um, so I'll just put three examples of use cases uh, that you know we've come across using uh, technology that we built, and they're in different domains. But I hope they show you how uh, you know, especially automated data collection can lead to very large data sets where you still want to run interesting algorithms on them. Uh, so the first one I'll talk about is from FINRA, which is um, uh, the Financial uh, Industry Regulatory Authorities. Uh, so FINRA is this is this interesting uh, kind of uh, organization. It's it's uh, it's governed by both um, you know like the the the, the U.S. government and by uh, the financial industry, and uh, it's an organization whose only goal is to regulate and detect you know, illegal trading activity uh, in, uh, in US markets, basically. So uh, equity markets, you know, uh, derivatives like options, uh, uh, things like that. And um, there's a lot of automated trading going on in those. And there are some, uh, there are, you know, some strategies that it's okay to do. And there are also some strategies or some behaviors that are uh, not uh, considered legal, that are, uh, you know, illegally trying to manipulate the stock price or maybe using you know, some kind of insider information or things like that. So the interesting thing about this is that there's a lot of data generated each day. They, they, they say, uh, you know, they gave a talk about this. So I, I'm just saying what, what um, they had in the talk like a couple of years ago. So they say uh, up to 100 billion events per day. And they also want to store historical data because sometimes these patterns of fraud and so on will happen over a time period. So they have at least 30 petabytes of historical data uh, about, again, trading activity that has happened in the US. And the goal is to identify you know, trading patterns, uh, possibly across exchanges and across commodities and so on, because people are trying to hide this activity uh, that, that indicate illegal activity. So it could be that someone's doing something in Chicago and then something else in New York, and actually the combination of those things is bad, or uh, you know, it could be they're doing something with commodities like two stock prices that are uh, you know, related, but they're not exactly the same, but they know that if you do something to one of them, it will, it'll affect the other one and so on. Um, and the way this works is that, you know, FINRA basically has to find uh, people who are, are doing something illegal and then actually like uh, basically open up a lawsuit against them and stuff like that. And so they have a combination of like hard uh, 
rules that they run where they've seen a pattern uh, you know, in this kind of graph of activities and, and events and entities that they know is bad, and then they search for it, um, and, and, you know, they collect evidence across time. Um, and they also have some machine learning um, algorithms where, you know, they, you, you have to use machine learning to find some types of activity, uh, but then they can do it reliably. And this is also where the historical data comes in, where when you discover one type of uh, fraudulent uh, behavior somehow, it's quite possible that more people were doing it in the past. So you also wanna go back and search that data for that pattern basically. Um, so these are, this is a slide that they gave in a talk. It's just kind of about the scale. I think I covered a lot of that, but the reason I like this slide is because it talks about some of the, the different entities involved. So. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, there, first of all, there are a lot of commodities uh, uh, being traded. So like lots of stocks, uh, you know, various types of options. Uh, that's one thing. Um, uh, then there are also different markets, different firms that are involved, like different companies, um, different brokers. So this is like someone at the company, maybe someone in you know, like Bank of America or whatever that you talk with. Um, and there are also different types of, um, of actions that they have to look for, basically. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense to connect these into a graph. And in fact, they do talk about the, they're reconstructing the graph of activity that happened in the market using a schema that's, you know, specific to what they care about. Um, and to do this, they use a number of technologies. So uh, the, this data comes in from multiple sources. And one of the big uh, pain points with before you can even set up a knowledge graph is like reliably ingesting and transforming the data. So that's one of the things that just basic Apache Spark is good for. It provides kind of map reduce and SQL and other APIs that you can use for, for that purpose. Um, then there's a lot of ad hoc queries and exploration, and that's done through SQL. One of the themes you'll see in my talk is that graph uh, processing is rarely done in isolation. It actually makes a lot of sense to have a common data model and query languages between your graph and just tabular data sets that you've got. So in this case, even though it is a graph, the majority of the queries are in SQL. Um, and then there's like identifying activities and that's a combination of uh, pattern matching, SQL and various algorithms. So I'll talk a little bit about some of those later. Okay, so a different domain that also has machine generated data is health and life science. I think you've seen a lot of these um, maybe applications already, but one, one example that you know we worked with is AstraZeneca uh, for drug discovery. And the background there is, um, you know, there are a lot of different molecules or compounds you can make in a lab that might be useful as drugs in some cases. There are a lot of potential diseases. There are a lot of types of patients, maybe one, uh, one drug works well for, you know, patients uh, at a certain age group, but not another age group. And so these drug companies are always trying to find a combination of like a compound and a treatment regimen and a target and so on where they can work. That's why you see all this work now, for example, with COVID-19 on repurposing existing drugs, because just testing a new drug from scratch and so on is quite, um, is a, is quite time consuming and expensive. But if you've got something that's been proven safe and you know how to manufacture, but you find a new use case for it, that's good. So AstraZeneca is one such company that decided to build a knowledge graph for this purpose. And there's really a lot of interesting sources of knowledge that go in. So there's like genomics or proteomics. This is high throughput sequence data. You can look at a cell and see what proteins are in there and what genes and what RNA, which means genes that are actually producing stuff. Um, and you can look at that. Uh, then there's medical records of patients, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to see if there are patterns in those. Uh, then there's a lot of literature coming out. So they put these into the knowledge graph as well, or databases of data to figure out, you know, is there research that indicates that this compound might have an effect on like this process in, uh, in the body? Uh, and then there's also basic facts, like how do you encode basic facts about chemistry and so on uh, that you can then use for inference. And then the task is to, you know, given this knowledge graph, you either want to recommend new compounds that you want to test uh, uh, at various stages of the process, or maybe new targets for an existing uh, compound. Uh, so that's that's usually what they want to do. Um, so this is one. This is again a slide from a presentation from them. It talks about this, like one of the reasons they use a knowledge graph is because there are these different. 
goals that you have to have a successful drug. And it's actually kind of a multi-dimensional um, optimization problem. So there's what they call the target, which is, uh, you know, the, the compound works on some something else in the body. So is that thing like, you know, that it targets actually relevant to some disease? Um, does the right tissue, can you actually get it into the tissue? That's a problem with drug delivery. That's why we can't just, uh, you know, inject Clorox or light or whatever and, and cure uh, viruses that way. Uh, then there's like the safety, of course, does it, you know, is it actually safe in these margins? How does it combine with, with other drugs that people have? Uh, then there's, if there's a subset of patients that could get it, how do you know what that is? Uh, and then of course they think about the commercial potential of each thing they do. Is, is it actually gonna be profitable for the company to build uh, this treatment or not? Uh, so that's what they look at. Um, and so there are kind of two things that, that uh, they work on. One is just maintaining and building the knowledge graph. So this is kind of the stuff I talked about with Spark and SQL and so on for combining these data sources. And it's interesting, there's both public and internal data sources. Uh, and then the other part is now you have this large knowledge graph, how do you actually do inference on it and recommendations? So these are both, um, uh, you know, things that they have to worry about. Um, and again, the the actual stack for this is a, is a combination of different uh, tools. So there's like Apache, Spark, and SQL for the data preparation. Um, there's a lot of NLP using models like BERT. There's a bunch of embedding stuff, uh, uh, for, for example, with graph neural networks um, uh, to, turn, to create these, these recommendation algorithms. And there are also a lot of custom uh, data types that they have. Uh, so these are some of the challenges is how do you get all these things to work together at a large scale? Um, and then the final use case I'll talk about that, that has machine generated data. This is one I, I think is super interesting because it applies to a lot of uh, companies um, is network security. So this is one where um, actually Apple has given a talk about how they use um, Apache Spark and Delta and some other uh, technologies that we built for this purpose. Uh, so this is really interesting. So obviously network security or just like data security in general uh, for, a com for any company is a significant problem because if someone hacks into your company or compromises a user account and starts exfiltrating data, you know, you don't see anything happening by default. So they could be, you know, lots of, lots of information could be going out and you have no idea where it's happening. Um, so how can you monitor it, especially in a company with, you know, maybe tens of thousands of employees? Um, so that the way that this um, team does it, it's a common uh, way to do it, is to collect information about, um, as fine-grained as possible events that are happening in the computer system. And then much like the FINRA use case, they have both some hard rules that you just want to run over the data as it comes in and some uh, more heuristic methods like machine learning that identify you know, potential uh, breaches or bad behavior. And then once you identify one of those, you want to do a lot of ad hoc analysis after to see like, how did this person get into the system? Are there other things like this? You know, if they broke into one server, what other servers did, did that one talk to and so on? So the data sources here are really any kind of events from uh, networks or computer systems. And it can be as granular as like every TCP connection that someone does or every SSH connection, every time someone like you know, their device logs into a, a, a new Wi-Fi access point, uh, you can collect that and you can see unusual patterns, you know, like this person's device is suddenly uh, logging in in a different country or something of that form. Um, and so it's very easy to collect like petabytes of data over time. In fact, you have to be careful about like what you actually want to collect. Um, and then uh, the task, well, I guess I, I copy pasted the wrong task, but the task is to find, <laughs> uh, the task is to find these patterns that indicate malicious activity. And then also if you do find it, to investigate uh, what happened in that breach and how can you remediate it. Um, so it's important to be uh, quick and interactive for that part so you can actually catch the things that are going wrong. Um, so it's very natural to organize this data as a graph. And again, this is a slide from their talk where they show how to do that. Um, so you can see, uh, for example, in here you had one process that you think you know might have been compromised or something, and you can see that process maybe kicked off other processes um, and uh, and sent commands to other nodes. Uh, and then on each node, you can see the commands that they executed, and you can also see flows like maybe 
you can see there's a flow where uh, some, some data was actually being uh, sent to the internet or requested from the internet or whatever, which could mean that the attacker is trying to exfiltrate data or trying to install, you know, uh, malware like some malicious package or something like that. Uh, so it's natural to have these as a graph. Um, and it's easy to collect a lot of data. They, they said it's at least 100 terabytes of data uh, per day. And you also want to store it very long term because you might not discover a breach until, you know, sometimes it can be like months or a year after it happens. So you want to go back and see, wait, how did this get in here? And uh, what else has that person done while they were, you know, while they compromised like some credentials or whatever they compromised to get in there. Uh, so it's a challenging problem from that perspective. Um, and so again, the technology is used, obviously this is a use case using um, Apache Spark. Um, the other interesting technology here that I might talk about for long-term storage is uh, this thing called Delta Lake, which is a way uh, to store data in these cheap um, object storage systems like Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage, uh, but still have um, efficient indexing and efficient point updates and so on uh, throughout it. So it's basically like an ACID uh, database table uh, built on top of cloud storage. So the cost in dollars is similar to if you just had a dump of like data in, in these archival systems, but then you can do a lot more operations on it a lot more efficiently than just scanning through a lot of files. Um, so that was an important part for the historical aspect of this. Um, and again, it's a wide range of algorithms and it's important that you know, within a, a company of this size, there will be like tens or maybe hundreds of analysts just working on uh, data security. So it's important to make it easy to write new, you know, detection rules and algorithms and also to then run them on uh, potentially large amounts of data. Um, so, so that's kind of what they did. Uh, so just to summarize from these use cases, so graphs with machine generated data can go really large and they do lead to very interesting applications. So it makes sense to store and query this data. Um, we see at least that a lot of um, actual workloads including graphs also include some ad hoc analysis and some non-graph algorithms so we've worked pretty hard on uh, unifying these and making them easy to combine i'll show how that works um, and then also at this scale many algorithms need to be either linear or sublinear in time so like for example if, if you had to do an analysis on this historical data, data set and you had to scan through all of it that in itself might be like prohibitively expensive. So you need to figure out how to index the data or the graphs or whatever to make it fast. Okay, so that's, that's a, some use cases that hopefully motivate, uh, you know, what we're doing. Uh, so next, like how, how do we actually do it and what APIs came out? Um, so, uh, so obviously, I've mostly been working uh, with the Apache Spark engine. Um, if you're not super familiar with it, uh, it's, a, it's a general purpose uh, uh, engine for like distributed computation on clusters. And one of the main goals of the project was to make it a unified engine where you can implement a lot of algorithms um, and interfaces as libraries on top of the same engine. And this was again, because we found that real workflows, uh, you know, involve a variety of algorithms, anything from basic SQL queries to machine learning, uh, to graph processing or to custom map and reduce code. Um, so that was the kind of the goal of Spark as a research project when I was working on it at Berkeley. Uh, and that's definitely one of the goals of the open source project. And the project comes in with a bunch of libraries built in, um, including actually graphics, which is based on an early um, you know, graph processing system uh, uh, called Graph Lab from, uh, from CMU. Um, we implemented a, uh, some parts of that on top of Spark. Um, but actually the, the newest thing, and the, the thing that most people are using is actually different from this. It's, a, it's something called graph frames that basically combines the graph algorithm and SQL and ad hoc query components. So I wanna talk about that because it's based precisely on the experience of having a separate graph library and then seeing some of the pain points with that. Um, so that's the graph frames package. And so the idea of this is that, you know, even though graphs are seen as a different data type and so on, you can actually implement graphs as a table. And there are a lot of benefits to doing graph computations in a SQL engine. There are a lot of existing optimizations and concepts like indexing that directly help. And actually this has been the trend in a lot of research on large scale graph analytics, it's certainly not just graph frames, is on how can you use the existing technology and 
like the decades of optimization we have in SQL engines to, to do uh, graph computation. Um, and so, so with, and, and it also provides a nicer API because you can do ad hoc queries or data transformation in SQL, and then you can run graph algorithms uh, on top of that. Um, so that's what we try to do here. So the, it's, it's basically data frames are one of the APIs for uh, doing, uh, you know, SQL computation in Spark, and we augment them so you can have a set of data frames that represent the graph. And then you can do SQL operators, uh, you can do graph pattern matching, which is a common uh, thing or motif finding that, that can be used to filter down graphs. And you can also run different algorithms like connected components and page rank and uh, you know, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and, and this is an open source package. Um, so basically benefits from all the stuff in the engine. Um, it's actually started as this paper that um, I worked on um, uh, when I was at MIT um, before joining Stanford. And um, so it's, it's with, it involves like both uh, some Spark people and also Joey Gonzalez, who is uh, one of the authors of uh, Graph Lab. So uh, it's based on kind of experience using, um, using both these systems. Um, and in terms of how it compares to other uh, graph processing libraries, at least at the time we saw that there were two pretty distinct sets of libraries. Uh, there were ones that just had the algorithms like page rank or connected components or you know, mincot or whatever, these kind of things. And then there were other libraries based on graph queries that let you search for a subset of the graph with some properties. So pattern matching or motif finding uh, like Neo4j and Titan. And in graph frames, we wanted to combine both of these things. So before this graphics was only doing the left side. Okay, so very briefly, how does it work? How do you think about it? Um, so it, the, the data structure is property graphs, which is a graph where each vertex and edge can also have properties on it, like additional fields about it. Um, so as an example, let's say we've got airports and flights between them. They form a graph. Um, so a vertex would be an airport and an edge would be one of the flights. Um, so these, these vertices and edges have additional properties. So like the vertex, for example, has an ID, but maybe there's additional information like what city is that airport in and what state is that in, you know, what country. So this is a, a table. And you could imagine you could also join this table with other tables you have in your, uh, in your uh, you know, uh, data collection uh, to do uh, analytics after. And likewise, an edge, you know, it's, it's a connection in the graph, but it also has properties uh, beyond the source and destination, like maybe the, the flight duration or the trip ID or whatever. Okay, so that's a, that's a property graph. So how do you represent them? Uh, they're literally just two tables, like two Spark tables or data frames uh, in, the, in the programming model. Um, uh, so, so they're just these two tables that you have and you can create something called the graph frame by passing at these two data frames and saying, you know, which fields represent, uh, basically which fields represent the vertex ID and which fields are the source and destination. Um, so you can build these tables however you want. You know, you can do ad hoc processing with like Python data frame operations or SQL or, you know, machine learning algorithms, whatever you want. They can just produce a data frame um, and then you pass these in and then all the graph algorithms know how to join these two and do stuff with them. Uh, and moreover, if you set up these data frames to be indexed in some way or sorted or partitioned, uh, these algorithms know how to take advantage of the partitioning to minimize the computation cost. Okay, so how do you actually work with them? I'll just briefly show a few things you can do. Um, simple queries, pattern matching, and graph algorithms. Um, so uh, very simple queries uh, are often easiest to express as just operations on their vertices and edges. And you can just do that using SQL or using the data frame APIs in Spark. So for example, you can filter vertices Let's say I want a graph with just the airports in New York. I can just call like, you know, vertices that filter with this and get those and then get the graph out of it. Uh, or I can maybe select, I want to figure out what's the biggest flight delay. I can just run a query on the edges table. Um, so, so, then, so this makes it easy to do simple queries. Um, but then the first thing that gets more graph oriented is something called motif finding or pattern matching, uh, which is um, f matching, not searching, not just a vertex or an edge, but maybe a group of vertices and edges that are related. And we adopt this, this uh, kind of powerful and nice uh, API from uh, Neo4j, which is the, the cipher query language for pattern matching. Um, so what you can do is you can 
you can say I want to find um, a set of like any kind of subgraph that I want in a particular shape. I want to find all instances that match the shape. And then there's this language in here for specifying what you're looking for. Uh, so let's look at this example here. Uh, so this example is, um, first of all, I want to find um, a, a motif where I have a vertex A and then an edge and then some other vertex B. So it's going so it's gonna match any subgraph that looks like this. So basically any edge. Um, so, so that's A and B over here. Uh, but then the other thing that I want is I also want to find uh, B needs to have an edge to some other vertex named C. Uh, so, for example, in this case, if A is JFK and B is um, is uh, is Chicago, and th then there's this, or, or sorry, is Dallas, I guess. Then there's the, there's this edge in here. Um, so, and then finally, the last part says I don't want an edge between C and A. So, for example, these are airports where um, you can fly from this one in in two hops in this direction, but you can't get a direct flight back. That's what this query means. Um, and so, so that's, so that's going to match this set of airports and it'll actually match any other set of airports in the graph that have this property. Um, so this is what you can use together with filtering on these, like for example, the, the flight has to be this long or whatever, you can use it to search for patterns. And this is how a lot of those fraud patterns and uh, security patterns and so on came out. And then the result of this query is going to be a table that has an entry for each match. And these things A and E1 and B and so on are going to be fields in the table. So then you can just filter this, this table that you've got or query it otherwise. For example, you can say, I want to filter all the ones where the, the delay is 20 minutes, or I want to compute the, the total number of such paths that start at JFK or whatever. So whatever SQL query you want on this. So you can easily go back between uh, graph pattern matching and uh, SQL queries, basically. Uh, and the language itself, as I said, is uh, is based on this cipher language. Okay, so that's that. Um, and then the final component that that um, that um, uh, graph frames provides is graph algorithms. So a lot of common algorithms like PageRank, shortest path, you know, uh, connected components, uh, strongly connected triangle counting, and so on. Uh, they're just implemented uh, in the library so that uh, users can just call them. Um, so this is its own, um, and, and then it also provides input and output, like loading the, the graph from kind of standard uh, data format, such as Parquet. Um, so this is kind of a brief overview of how these applications work. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff in these, and I don't really have time to cover them, but you know, just one brief thing I wanted to mention is in scaling up graph algorithms, uh, even something as simple as connected components, if you want to run it distributed with very few rounds of communication, uh, there are some really cool algorithms. So, uh, for example, for connected components, uh, there's this algorithm um, con uh, in this paper that's a pretty recent paper on connected components in MapReduce and beyond um, that shows how you can, like normally with the naive algorithm, you have to walk to each edge and the cost is proportional to the diameter of the graph. Uh, but this algorithm, it's more like a union find and the cost becomes uh, logarithmic in the edge of the graph. So, uh, so it's a lot faster to find these components. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of um, stuff there that I don't have time uh, to cover and uh, it is a lot faster than, uh, than doing it the naive way. Uh, so that's, that's kind of, um, you know, just a brief overview of, uh, of these APIs. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to talk about is just to go back to bigger picture, like what are some of the remaining challenges uh, for large scale knowledge graphs and other graph processing. And I think there are still two big challenges beyond the algorithm that really impact the results. So the first one is data management. How do you reliably store, transform, and index these data sets, especially as they're changing? Um, one thing we're finding is with um, uh, you know, a lot of organizations, uh, you, you also need to go back and change the data quite often. Um, and um, it can be a challenge for a lot of the tools in the space. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're doing in this Delta Lake project. Um, and then the other interesting problem is once you've built an application, let's say using machine learning, how do you make sure it keeps working? And there's all this work on kind of platforms uh, that, uh, that monitor your application and let you fix it or let you hold back to an old version when it's breaking. And that's another area where uh, we're working on with, uh, with, uh, with this MLflow project. Um, 
but yeah, I hope I hope this given you a sense of what people do with large scale, uh, some of the tools and all the stuff that I talked about uh, is open source and there are a lot of tutorials. So if you want to see uh, like some of these use cases, you know, like searching for a pattern or whatever it's in there. I also included links to the slides about the uh, the use cases that I went through. Um, so yeah, hope hope this is useful and I'm definitely happy to take questions about it. Well, thank you, Matea. It's an uh, excellent overview of your work. And uh, uh, you missed the first part of our session, but uh, we had a presentation from uh, folks from Neo4j mm -hmm. and uh, they immediately reacted to your claim that uh, your graph language is um, same as Cipher. It seems it's inspired by Cipher, but not exactly. Cipher. Yeah, it's not exactly the same. We'd like to make it the same, but it's not um, exactly the same, so yeah. Yeah, and Mate, I didn't hear that you said it was the same. I just wanted to clarify that it's 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 not the same, and there's a TCK and so on. Um, yeah, yeah, out there. yeah. I think yeah. I like. I mean, the effort to standardize it is great, and uh, I think we've been we've been uh, talking to the group doing that. But it's it's currently not the same, unfortunately. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, we do have a, a good twenty minutes for questions. So Narendra, do we have an audience question we could take up? Yes, sure. So there's some interest around machine learning and deep learning on graphs. What are uh, so it'll be great to hear from all the speakers. What kind of uh, features are you guys coming up with? Graph embeddings, link prediction, that those kinds of uh, functionality. So maybe we can start with Mate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, about machine learning on graphs. Yeah, so so a lot of these, a lot of the use cases we saw do involve machine learning and um, the. For, I, I think the closest, the one that had the most of this happening was the the healthcare one I talked about. And it had, let's see if I can go back to it. It had machine learning both in constructing the graph, um, like for example, looking at these articles and doing the NLP and entity linking and so on to, to build it. Uh, and then it had machine learning afterwards and finding, for example, they they use um, you know graph convolutional neural networks to build uh, embeddings and so on. Um, so I think in here, I mean, we, we work on a case by case basis to see what, what algorithms people are trying to run and how to scale them up. Uh, we also try to, uh, you know, if possible to, uh, to, to come up with sort of general solutions, like something that takes, you know, let's say any TensorFlow model and uh, can apply it uh, on a graph and, and compute something. Uh, so that's what we've been doing. Uh, this is actually one area where um, I've also been involved in a research project at Stanford on scaling up graph neural networks um, with, uh, with Alex Aiken and, and his students, Jihao uh, Jia. So, so we actually have a pretty exciting, like kind of new on time for graph neural networks that might be interesting. Uh, I can send a link to the paper after, I guess. Um, yeah. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, does any other speaker want to respond to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer. I, I think the answer was mostly embedded inside of my presentation. Um, but just to recap, you have two kinds of inputs, as I see it, that uh, uh, they could be outputs of a graph and input into a machine learning process. One is a, the result of a pattern match, which could be transactional, uh, or it could be non-transactional, oftentimes transactional. Uh, and then you also have the output of a um, graph algorithm and uh, that uh, that can be represented as a scalar and just fed into a machine learning model and as far as the doing the former Neo4j that's through Cypher as far as doing the latter Neo4j that's through the graph data science library. Okay, thanks. Okay. And from the Neptune side we've got examples of customers using the different AWS technologies like Comprehend uh, and then we released the deep graph library on GitHub uh, was last year. And those effectively involve you taking exports of either a, a query or your whole graph using it to train models and then bringing the scoring back into the database. So another question that uh, came up early on was that why should we use a graph database and why shouldn't we just put everything in the relational database? And one of you, tried to make a case for a graph database. Uh, but I think what Matea showed in his presentation was that he could take the underlying relational infrastructure and on top of that, build a library which is 
suited for graphs and it's equally efficient. So is there any resolution here or, I mean, you can go either way, it makes no difference? Oh, I should, I should kind of clarify that. I mean, the devil's in the details, right? It depends how much time you spend. So there are some use cases where you could totally tailor build a database. It's the same thing as even relational databases. You know, each one is, is good for one type of workload, but maybe not another. So the, the thing we were doing is, is mostly analytics and kind of coarse grain, like updating many things in the graph at once. It's not maybe serving the graph for real time, like OLTP transaction processing. So for that, our approach has been, let's build everything on cloud storage. It's like much cheaper, you know, more scalable than, and easier to operate and so on than anything else. And I think we figured out good ways to do that. Uh, but for other things that may not make sense, especially with rapidly changing uh, data, maybe. Um, yeah. And, and from my end, I, I would never tell someone not to use a relational database. That would be mad. Um, relational databases uh, are, you know, by, by far the uh, most uh, deployed kind of database out there. Like even saying that is an understatement. Um, the the um, having said that, the relational databases as the basis for graph querying, um, as, as Matei said, that, that A, depends on a particular vendor's product and what they make available. And I'd say that uh, it's probably more sympathetic with a relational model to, to, to do pre-compute into like a, uh, um, to, to run graph algorithms, which are less sensitive to latency um, than it, and which aren't, don't have a need to be updated in real time than it is to run uh, transactional queries with multiple hops with dense graphs. That's where relational databases tend to fall apart is with the um, large volumes of transactional pattern matching that are low latency, uh, that are mutable, and where, um, and where you have a, uh, uh, some amount of density in the graph and some number of hops. And, and, and it's not just the, uh, the um, it's both the performance uh, as well as the, uh, the language and also the flexibility of the model. If the, and a big disadvantage of uh, relational when it comes to data that you don't know the shape of in advance is you need to spend months in a room with very smart data modelers figuring out how do you model this thing. But if you don't know what the thing looks like, then there can be a great advantage to taking a, a schema free approach, or let's say a not, not a schema locked approach where you allow this semi-structure into the graph and- um, Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that argument seems a little problematic because what Matea showed was that he just has two tables and you can put any schema in those two tables. Why do you need to design a schema? Uh, again, back to tr the transactional question, like that's the, the more you're into the analytic data warehousing uh, world, the more you can cram things in, you know, more and more, you, you can have a table of tables that just has, you know, in every, every, every row and column can be, you know, the row can be like a type column and you, you don't need multiple tables. But uh, I, I, as one of the presenters pointed out earlier, you get into, uh, databases that support applications and you end up with things like SAP and Oracle apps that have 20,000 tables, uh, you know, a very complex schema. And that's just needed for transactional applications. You, you can't take the approach you, uh, that Matei described in that world. All, all of those tables are sourced out of transactional systems that have complex schema. Okay. Cool. So a new question came in and I think this, so there's a lot of detailed questions that I think um, Matei or the other uh, speakers can uh, take a look at it offline, but here's a question that probably warrants some amount of discussion. Are there use cases um, that uh, you've used, uh, where you've used and modeled time series data in graphs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, for example, this, uh, the InfoSec use case I showed about the, the security one, uh, does, it definitely uh, has time series involved because you need to see like what happened before and, and after something, right? Like 
after this this uh, person connected to this server, you know, it started sending data over here. But it, you know, if it was doing it before, that means something else. Um, so it's a it's a historical data set, and I think the the, the most fraud detection type use cases also have some element of time, depending what's going on. But yeah, yeah, anything can be modeled as a graph. I mean, graphs are a, a super model in the sense that all other model, you know, key key value document relational can all be modeled as a graph. Having said that, um, it comes down to what your requirements are for time series. If your requirement is to be able to do like a, a chart, a, a Cartesian chart of um, uh, data that's emitted by an, an electrical um, utility that's uh, where you're capturing 120 um, measurements per second and you wanna be able to view down to a, a second, uh, a minute, a month, uh, a time series database does that really well. There's a lot of built-in functionality for it. So even though that can be modeled in a, in a graph, Neo4j certainly doesn't have that kind of specialized time series functionality built in. So I'd recommend putting that into a specialized time series database. Um, on the other hand, if, uh, if you have, depending on your requirement for time series, that can be easily modeled as a, as a linked list, for example. And if your processing requirement and your data is, uh, you know, more tied into graph kinds of querying, then uh, then it might be suitable to put it into graph database. Okay. So there's a couple of questions. No, go ahead, Avinay. Yeah. So I think the other question that has been on my mind is that all of you talked about. Um, general patterns and I mean, how complex can these patterns I mean? Are they, are they complex set of rules? And then there is a more general form of that question that in addition to RDF, do you guys care at all about the ontological knowledge, knowledge which is expressed at the level of classes, which is also a kind of graph, but it's not a graph at the instance level. So there are two separate questions. You know, what, what's your view on ontological knowledge and what's your view on uh, need or requirement for a complex set of rules that need to operate on the data? I'm happy to take that, but uh, Brad or Matei, do you wanna take that first? Uh, there's, there's the RDF specific answer is probably uh, easier, let's say. I mean, I'm happy to to talk on from the from the Neptune side. You know, I think from from our side, from for knowledge graph use cases and lots of other ones, we absolutely see the need for ontologies and schemas of various different kinds of representational complexity. Um, in Neptune today, we don't support uh, in database inferencing, so we would obviously, you know, you could store the kind of materialized triples or the fully entailed uh, triples from a given ontology that you might want to have, uh, but we wouldn't, for example, do truth maintenance, although we absolutely see those as, as important, um, you know, for those kinds of use cases. On the Neo4j side, it's uh, not uncommon for people to maintain a separate graph, uh, which can actually be stored in a separate database now, now that Neo4j has a, a multi-database feature and, uh, and store the rules there or store the rules elsewhere in an application. Actually, um, what I've heard, I haven't worked with RDF hands-on myself, uh, but we have a lot of Neo4j folks who have and those who have worked in professional services in the RDF world in the past have said that oftentimes um, uh, managing rules via via OWL and enforcing them, um, the more complex the rules get, the more difficult that gets. So in the real world, oftentimes people um, find, end up finding other means to do it, uh, which, which could be embedding uh, as data in the graph uh, or embedding outside the graph. Um, so I, I, I don't know that there's a good or a single answer. It's, uh, there, there are a lot of different ways to do it. I have sort of a, a tongue in cheek rule that I use, which is that, you know, I view kind of ontology modeling and inferencing as a lot like hot sauce and that, a, you know, a little bit really enhances a meal, but it's very easy to put too much on and spoil everything. And, uh, you know, I often find that when you think about these kinds of projects, you need to balance uh, 
the questions that you're trying to answer and the things you're trying to simplify and keep them scoped so it doesn't, uh, you know, tightly for it to be successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would say I haven't seen like one way to do this. I think people are doing it in different ways. And I, I do agree with what Brad said, which is, I think you can go kind of crazy trying to have a lot uh, then that it becomes very hard to maintain. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So a new open sort of a, a broad question just came up around visualization capabilities in each product. So I think the fun thing about graphs is graph DBs is you can visualize them much better than uh, SQL databases. Uh, so could all of you sort of speak what kind of uh, visualization capabilities you guys are thinking about? I know uh, Neo4j has all these nice uh, dancing sort of nodes and all that, but I'd love to learn more about. Yeah, uh, so, so a version of that question that I have is that, is anybody doing real work or are those graphs meant for PowerPoint slides? The, um, I think uh, my observation is visualization plays a really useful role in learning. And that's not just learning about graphs, it's about learning about your data as you've got data in, in the database and to the degree that you don't have schema defined or enforced, that's both a, a blessing and a curse. Um, and so being able to uh, actually see the data um, and, and see that visually, not just like in a tabular or some other fashion is, is helpful. And that's why we've uh, included since uh, actually 2013 is when we launched this is a uh, graph visualization capability um, inside of the uh, development tool, uh, the Neo4j browser. And then uh, there's, a, there's a whole you know, series of products that are, um, uh, and, and different categories of uh, graph vis visualization that are, that are emerging where if you're a business user, there are some certain workflows where if, if you can see the data in the right way, then um, uh, visualizing it as a graph through like an entity link circles and lines kind of projection can allow you to identify fraud like that. Fraud has a shape, it turns out. Whereas um, if you present someone with uh, data in spreadsheets, that same conclusion might take them 10 minutes to draw with a lesser degree of accuracy than, than the visual aspect. Um, and there are uh, those kinds of solutions tend to be very bespoke, um, i.e. not handled with out of the box tooling um, because, uh, because business users generally have very specific requirements and they already have applications. So that ends up being things that people build on consulting product, pro projects with technologies like D3 and so on. Um, Neo4j also offers a um, product called Bloom, which uh, uh, ships free with the Neo4j desktop for local use um, for doing uh, code-free graph exploration. Um, how useful that is, uh, jury's out. It was a, a speculative uh, product for us. Um, and uh, we're, we're getting some good feedback. Um, and. Uh, as, as to whether that's more something used by a technologist or a business person, I'd say probably more the former. I'd put it more in the bucket of, uh, you know, a, a, a useful um, tool in your, you know, in your toolbox for, uh, for working with graphs. But uh, again, this, this is a really young space and there's a lot of innovation happening. So jury's out on, on all of these questions. Brad, would you like to speak about some visualization? Sure. I mean, I, I think I, I agree with a lot of the things that have been said. I think from a Neptune side, as, as terms of what we support, we launched something called the Neptune Workbench um, last December that provides you a Jupyter Notebook experience that you can use to connect to your Neptune instance and issue uh, various Gremlin and Sparkle queries and then use the mechanisms within the Jupyter Notebook to visualize them. I think it is important for people as they develop their graphs to visualize it, to help understand their data model, their layout, uh, those pieces. I think that it's really important for knowledge graph applications, but not as a general graph visualization as something that 
you think about when you're building your knowledge graph and putting it into production that there's certain things that you want business activities to be able to see that you use those visualizations. And those I would put into the much more custom and tailored camp. The other thing that I would say that we see a lot is customers that want to visualize their graph within the context of existing BI tools that they might have. You know, so it's things like Tableau, but other, other cases too. And I think that's uh, something that we see a lot from customers too. So we're hmm. almost near the end. Mike, do you have any questions? No. Maybe you can take one final question. Sure, so there are a lot of very uh, detailed questions uh, about uh, graph neural network library from PyTorch, et cetera. Should we answer that or like take and end with a I, visionary question? Well, there was this, well, what is your visionary question? <laughs> what are the next set of features that everyone has on their mind that they're working on next? Well, let's, let's take 30 seconds each and then let's call it a wrap. Philip? Uh, next set of features. So we, we just actually released a huge pile of stuff. And actually, the, the thing we're working on now is making everything work with everything else. Uh, because you know we, we were faced with the choice of um, spend another six months to a year making everything work with everybody else, with, with everything else or, uh, or just you know release the, the independent things. Um, so uh, really, a combination of uh, Neo4j 4.0, which adds schema-based graph security, multi-database, uh, reactive programming. This just came out, um, and getting but getting that to work with the graph data science library, which just happened a few weeks ago. Getting that to work with Bloom, which just happened. Getting that to work with Aura, which is our um, uh, graph database as a service. Uh, so. Uh, it's, it's okay, about, that's, that's 30 seconds. So Brad? All right. Yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, we want to make Neptune a great platform to build knowledge graphs on. I think that, you know, for us, that means making it very easy to do all the things you want to do, connect to the data that you want to, uh, bring in the different machine learning and deep learning models uh, that you want to. And, you know, as I said in my talk, I think we really see it about enabling this broader space of making it easy to use graph at the scale you want with a low operational cost. Awesome. Matteo? Yeah, so, so for us, there are a few uh, areas that are interesting. I think one of them is we, we consistently see that the data preparation, especially doing that reliably, is the biggest uh, pain point for users. And uh, we um, have a lot of interesting tools there, like some that have been released, some that are still on the way. For, for example, one thing that we released is uh, a very low cost versioning of all your data sets in the data lake. So we can uh, track changes over time and let you hold back to an old version. It's, it's very easy to, uh, to go and fix things this way. Uh, another thing we're working on is like data quality, um, you know, uh, expectations and ways to automatically check when something is breaking. Uh, so these are the things that we found save people the most uh, time long term. Uh, I think on the kind of performance and flashy algorithm side, there's a lot of uh, performance that we're putting into our SQL engine and also that the open source community is putting uh, into Apache Spark that immediately helps these graph applications. So that's like one of my favorite things about it is we may not do anything literally on, on the graph for a quarter, but then at the end of the quarter, it's still gotten a lot faster because of you know a different thing that happened somewhere else. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. It was such a fantastic panel. I think one of the best we've had in the whole series. Thank you all for giving us your time and uh, we look forward to using your products. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye.